Hello, everyone. I wanted to uh, bring your attention to a couple of articles. Um, this one, ex-chief science officer for Pfizer, says second wave likely conjured up by flawed test that the pandemic is over. This Dr. Mike Yeadon, a former vice president and chief science officer for Pfizer for 16 years, says that half or even almost all of tests for COVID are false positives. And he says that we are basing a government policy, an economic policy, a civil liberties policy in terms of limiting people to six people in a meeting based on what may well be completely fake data on this coronavirus. In the data for UK, Sweden, and the US and the world, it can be seen that in all cases, deaths were on the rise in March through mid or late April, and then began tapering off in a smooth slope, which flattened around the end of June and continues today. Uh, to today. The cases rates, however, based on testing, rise and swing upwards and downwards wildly. And they're nonstop propaganda, fear porn from mainstream media and even the, the social media. They're censoring of, of this information. I'm hoping that uh, they do not censor, this, censor me for putting this out. Uh, the survival rate of COVID now estimated to be 99.8%, similar to the flu. Although COVID can have serious after effects, so can the flu or respiratory illness. It's, it's, uh, it's apparent that uh, they, they are literally committing fraud. They're, they are lying. This is not about... Uh, saving lives or helping people. Um, I'll put this link down below, but I want to bring you to another article. Uh, this is called The Hazards of the COVID-19 Vaccine, and it was from about a month ago, written by a professor from Department of Pharmacology and toxicology at the College of Medicine and University of Philippines, Manila. Uh, the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is fraught with hazards. This should be the obvious rational conclusion of anyone who cares to objectively study the available scientific and other relevant information about it. There are many factual danger signals that are easily discernible. One of the big safety concerns being that it may actually enhance the pathogenicity of the virus or make it more aggressive. Uh, and then they go on to talk about the fact that there is an entirely new RNA vaccine technology, which is has never been used before in humans. And uh, several of the U.S. candidates, Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, Arcturus Therapeutics, are using this never-before-approved technology. The exogenous mRNA is inherently immunostimulatory, and this feature of the mRNA could be beneficial or detrimental. Another danger of mRNA vaccines is the use of the biotech carrier systems involving lipid nanoparticles, LNPs, which encapsulate the mRNA constructs to protect them from degradation and promote cellular uptake. Uh, the LNP formulations in the three mRNA COVID-19 vaccines are also pegylated, meaning that the vaccine nanoparticles are coated with a synthetic, non-biodegradable, and increasingly controversial polymer called polyethylene glycol, PEG. PEG can also provoke severe neuropsychiatric symptoms in offsprings, including mood swings, rage, phobias, and paranoia. 
investigators who once assumed that the polymer was largely inert are now questioning its biocompatibility and warning about pegylated particles, promotion of tumor growth, and adverse immune responses that include probably underdiagnosed life-threatening anaphylaxis. Like the mRNA vaccines, the adeno uh, vec adenoviral vector COVID-19 vaccines are still experimental and have not been used before in mass vaccination for infectious diseases. Given the history of a poor safety record of many vaccines, the risk of unpredictable and potentially disastrous adverse effects is almost is of utmost concern. Uh, yeah, it just it just gets worse and worse. They talk about the genetically engineered uh, vaccines and that they can carry significant unpredictability and potentially uh, be potentially hazardous. Uh, there's it's also the potential to transfer or recombine genetic material from genetically engineered viruses. Uh, to the targeted individual germ cell lines. It can also undergo chromosomal integration or insertional mutagenesis, leading to random insertions of vaccine constructs into host cellular genomes, resulting in alterations of gene expression or activation of cellular oncogenes, thus raising the possibility of inducing tumors. Uh, the risk of recombination was actually raised earlier in a meeting convened by the World Health Organization in 2003, uh, wherein the regulators representing the European Union, the U.S., China, and Canada raised the specific issue on recombination. Recombination of a live virus uh, vectored vaccine with a circulating or reactivated latent virus could theoretically generate a more pathogenic strain. The risk of recombination should be studied if possible in a non-clinical model system, but should also be considered in clinical study designs. This was listed among the re recommendations of, to the WHO and priorities for future work as one of several issues of critical importance to be investigated further. But apparently, however, the WHO, governments, and the vaccine industry never took this recommendation seriously. This comes as no surprise, given the history of the WHO's rapid approval and endorsement of several such live virus vector vaccines without the necessary and thorough safety studies, made especially concerning during the current mad scramble for a COVID-19 vaccine. Yes, indeed. <sighs> and then we go down here to find that uh, at least at least six of the COVID-19 vaccine candidates, Casino, AstraZeneca, Oxford, Janssen, Immunity Bio, Nant Quest, the University of Pittsburgh, and Altimmune, use one of two human fetal cell lines, the HEK293, a kidney cell line that comes from a fetus aborted in about 1972, and PER, C6, a proprietary cell line owned by Janssen, developed from retinal cells from an 18-week-old fetus aborted in 1985. There are many plausible biological mechanisms for potential adverse effects on of all of the vaccines in the pipeline for COVID-19. The history of vaccination is replete with scientific evidence of adverse effects through enhanced pathogenicity, patheno pathogenicity and mutation, recombination, induced immune system dysfunction, and various nonspecific effects following vaccination, despite regulatory approval and prior clinical trials and other corporate-sponsored studies that were claimed to be proof of safety. And then I want to bring your attention to uh, another article, uh, my friend Patrick Jordan shared with his list this morning, um, the intertwined history of myelitis in vaccines. This came out September 25th, 2020 by the Children's Health Defense Team. Although 38 COVID-19 vaccines are now undergoing clinical evaluation, a handful of candidates have been at the head of the pack from the beginning, including the vaccine developed by Oxford University in tandem with the British biopharma giant AstraZeneca. 
helped along by a whopping $1.2 billion infusion from U.S. taxpayers and $750 million from two Bill Gates-backed global health organizations. Um, oddly, CVS furnished this ringing endorsement for uh, shortly after Oxford and AstraZeneca called a temporary halt to their clinical trials in five countries. The brief hold was prompted by a UK participant after her second dose, uh, she reported a serious adverse event being a demyelating condition called transverse myelitis, or TM, associated with pain, muscle weakness, paralysis, bowel, and bladder problems. Two-thirds of those who experience TM remain permanently disabled. Belatedly, AstraZeneca also disclosed that the September pause was actually the second time out in two months. The first incident, which initially went unpublicized, occurred in July when another UK participant experienced TM after only one dose and ended up with a brand new diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So this should be concerning to all of us. Um, they have even admitted that vaccines are unavoidably unsafe. Um, in 1986, they gave these vaccine companies complete immunity for any harm caused by their vaccines, and they created the uh, National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program so that you have to go into the U.S. courts and file a federal claim to try to prove uh, when you are harmed by vaccines. Based on analysis of information posted at the U.S. Court of Federal Claims website, conditions involving demyelination and paralysis, TM, the ADEM, and Guillain-Barr syndrome, and chronic inflammatory demyelinating myelinating polyneuropathy are among the top vaccine injuries for which Americans, primarily adults, have filed claims with the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. Uh, in, most, in prior years, most uh, of the claimants linked their TM to hepatitis B vaccines, but in more recent years, the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, and influenza vaccines have become the principal suspects. A systematic review of TM case reports gleaned from 1970 to 2009 corroborates these claims, identifying 37 cases of TM associated with multiple vaccines given to infants, children, and adults, including the Hep B, the measles, mumps, rubella, and the DTP, and showing that TM symptoms can arise anywhere from several days to several months and possibly several years post-vaccination. So you have people lining up to get these vaccines because they're giving out uh, financial incentives uh, and no amount of money is, is going to be worth it if your life is destroyed um, and it could very well be. The inserts on the vaccines uh, even link TM. Uh, the information is there. I mean, of course, doctors are not going to give you the, the inserts. You would have to ask for them, and, and they would probably be offended uh, because they're towing the party line. Vaccines save lives. Vaccines are safe and effective. And we have this mad rush for Operation uh, Warp Speed to get a vaccine out for what appears to be a 99% uh survival rate, 99.8% survival rate. Anyways, let me know what you guys think about these articles and I will put the links down below.